Hello, greetings of the day. Uh, welcome to Physio TV. We are live, handing over the session to Dr. Avni Jain. Warm greetings. Welcome to today's session of Physio TV. Current trends in management of concussion in pediatrics by Dr. Devashish Tiwari. I am Avni Jain. I will be moderating today's session. I welcome our panelist for today, Dr. Swati Bhise. She is currently the principal of Bharti Vidyapeet School of Physiotherapy, Pune. She has completed her master's from All India Institute of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation, Mumbai in July 2005. She has also done her post-graduation diploma in hospital and healthcare management from Symbiosis International University, Pune. She has previously she was pre previously principal at late Shri Fakir Bhai Pansare Physiotherapy College, Pune. She has over 15 publications under her name and has given various seminars and workshops on entity, vestibular rehabilitation therapy, cognitive rehabilitation therapy, virtual hands-on workshops on meta-analysis, and many more countless numbers. I would request Dr. Swati Ma'am to introduce our speaker, Dr. Devashish Tiwari, handing over the session to you, Ma'am. Thank you, Dr. Avni. Welcome, Dr. Devashish Trivari, sir. Uh, Dr. Devashish Trivari is presently currently working in a assist, as an assistant professor in Siemens University, Boston, Massachusetts. Sir has completed his graduation from Ravi Nayak College of Physiotherapy. He has completed his master from Manipal University, Karnataka. He also has completed uh, the Neurological Clinical Specialist Certification course. Uh, he has completed in Doctor of Doctor of Philosophy from University of Michigan. And also he has completed Transitional Doctorate in Physical Therapy. He has uh, work experience in many uh, colleges and even in rehabilitation center, including uh, uh, D.Y. Patil College of Physiotherapy, then uh, Narayan Rehabilitation USA, then Neuron Intermediate School District from USA, then he was a course, course instructor in University of Michigan. He also has a work as an assistant professor in Massachusetts College of Pharmacy and Health Sciences and currently he has been working as an assistant professor in Siemens University, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Sir have completed many publications in national and international peer review journals. Sir has received award uh, twice in 2015 and 2016 uh, from Dean Student Scholarship Award. And also uh, Marilyn Gossman Graduate Student Research, Research Seminar Award in 2019. I'm sure everyone is eagerly waiting for his lecture. I would like to hand over to Dr. Thank you. Welcome, welcome, Dr. Ash, uh, Devashish Tiwari. Welcome, sir. We can start the session. All right. Thank you so much uh, for such a warm welcome, Dr. Bhise and Dr. Jan. I appreciate it. And it is very nice to be here. And thank you for the opportunity. Uh, so, good evening. And welcome everybody to today's discussion on pediatric concussions and physical therapy management perspectives. So I understand it's uh, Friday evening, so I will try my best to make sure that I will keep you awake. All right, so let's go ahead and get started. Okay. So here are some things that we will talk about today. So first we'll take a little bit of a look at the background of pediatric concussions. Then we will identify a few things in which children, they are different from adult population. And these are some considerations that we should have while managing children post concussion. Then we will take a look at some indicators of concussion signs and symptoms, some long-term consequences then we are going to delve a little bit into the history and examination tools pertinent to pediatric population. And finally, we will take a look at what we know so far in, in the realm of physical therapy and what is the state of intervention evidence. And then at the end, we will 
make sure that we have adequate time for any questions and answers. All right, so let us talk a little bit about uh, the background of pediatric concussions. So pediatric concussion, folks, is something that has come up in the recent few years. This was not something that was reported like maybe 10, 12 years ago. So we still know very little about pediatric concussion. So since now we see that there is an increase in participation of children and adolescents in individual and or team sports, so the incidence of concussion is on the rise overall. And it is a very serious concern for the young athletes. So exposure to contact sports at younger ages can lead to a long-term exposure to repetitive head trauma. So there is also an issue in terms of reporting. So think about a teenager who is into, say, maybe a football game or, say, a rugby game or something like that. So they would not want to report even though they are feeling the symptoms because they are so energetic, they would want to get back to the game. So pediatric concussions, they are underreported quite significantly. So this leads to a long-term exposure to repetitive head trauma and can lead in consequences of the immediate effect on athletes' daily life and can impact the day-to-day -day activities. And this is a cause of continued concern among parents, athletes, and the healthcare providers. In an ideal world, we would want to prevent the concussions as much as we can. Because I say this from a personal experience, because I've had three concussions myself, and fortunately or unfortunately, none of them were treated. So that is why the prevention is ideal in all circumstances, and we are currently working towards it. So now, a little bit of a background on what exactly is concussion. So concussion is something that can result from blow to the head, neck, or face with any amount of impulsive, this is most commonly seen in sports or motor vehicle accidents. So what this force or trauma does is it leads to a short-term impairment of neurologic function. And this further leads down to functional disturbance that usually resolve over a period of the next few weeks. Now, it has been reported that anywhere between 43 to 67,000 out of 1.2 million high school football players, they sustain concussion in any given year. And this is a data from uh, 2000, but now the most recent data that was reported in 2021, it says that anywhere between 1 to 2 million children under the age of 18 years they sustain concussions which are related to sports in the United States alone. And also 30 to 45 million children who participate in non-organized sports, they report of having concussions. And 7.6 million adolescents, that is anywhere between 13 to 18 years of age group, they participate in high school athletics and are the highest at risk group for sustaining concussions. We also now know that risk of concussions is three times higher if the child has a history of previous concussions. As we can see that risk ratio reported here is approximately three and a half times that if a child has history of previous one or two concussions, it is three to three and a half times more likely that this child will have another concussion as compared to the child who does not have history of sustaining a sport-related concussion. So a few statistics in India. Uh, the mild traumatic brain injury constitutes of 70 to 90% of all head injuries with rates of hospital treatment ranging from 100 to 300 per 100,000 people per annum. And as we can see that the rate of treatment and hospital admission is still very, very low in India. And that is kind of highlighting 
the extent of under reporting and lack of medical care for concussions and it is now known that a large number of cases they are not treated at hospital and the actual rate is possibly in excess of more than 600 people per 100000 cases so as we can see that only half one sixth of the population receives medical treatment in india for mild to moderate brain injury so that was a little bit about why concussions are important why they are a big deal and what is their current incidence and prevalence so now let us take a look at how this is different from adult population how pediatric folks are different from adults all right so this is an interesting uh, gif that you can see this bobble head so think of a child exactly this way as you can see mickey mouse here So if you notice the size of the neck and size of the head they are way disproportional that means children they usually have a bigger head and a relatively smaller and weaker neck and even if you look at the shoulders right here they are very much underdeveloped as compared to adults so what this does is this increases the amount of force and impact multifold when children they sustain any injury to the head so here are some key points so it is now known that children they sustain a higher rates of concussion as compared to older athletes and since the brain is still immature it is still developing in children so brain's tolerance to biomechanical force in children it is a lot different from adults and it is now known that at least 2 to 3 times higher force it is required to produce symptoms in children as compared to adults so whenever a child reports to you of any symptoms that means the child has sustained a significant amount of trauma to the brain so these are some biomechanical factors and if we look at the normalization or returning of symptoms to pre concussion baseline level or return of neurocognitive functions to baseline level we can see that as compared to 3 to 5 days of time frame in professional adult athletes adolescents they take 10 to 14 days so that means anywhere between 2 to 3 times longer the time frame is to return to baseline pre concussion functional level and also it is noted that children they experience prolonged and more severe cervical spine impairments and vestibular impairments than the adults so to sum up or highlight the key buckets of information in terms of differences between children and adults we can put them into five broad buckets so the first here is the immature nervous system that we just talked about the neurons they are still myelinating and they have not reached full maturity larger head to body ratio that increases the impact many fold as compared to adults this also is related to underdeveloped neck and shoulder muscles and now since we are in iphone and android generation so we see there is a lot of forward neck posture poor extensor muscle strength deep neck neck flexor strength so all these factors they contribute to increase susceptibility of pediatric population to sustaining concussions additionally children they have thinner cranial bones since the bones are still soft and the sutures are not yet fused so additionally they have large subarachnoid space that means the brain can move around a lot more freely inside the skull as compared to a grown adult and of course there are differences in cerebral blood volume so now let us take a peek at what are some indicators of concussions and what are some symptoms and what are some long term consequences so as a physical therapist we work closely with children 
who are actively involved in sports and many a times we are present on the field. So it is very important for us to know what concussion looks like and what are some tests and measures that we should accomplish in field to ensure that we are ruling out a concussion. So the primary indicators of concussion can be classified under four broad categories. First and foremost, observe for any disorientation and confusion in field. So now it is very important to know folks that it is not necessary that all the symptoms, they will appear immediately following a trauma. It is quite likely that symptoms may take one to two days post-trauma to appear in their full intensity. So that is why these children, they should be either receiving immediate attention on the field or they should be given medical attention as soon as possible if on-field medical attention is not available. So we should check for balance impairments, reaction times one to two days post injury. And we should also look if there is any impaired verbal ability. That means, is there any sign of slurred speech? Are there any memory deficits? Is there a, an episode of amnesia following a concussion? So all these findings should be carefully observed and documented. So symptoms, they can be broadly classified into four buckets. First, the cognitive features, that is thinking and remembering. So we can experience difficulty in thinking clearly, or maybe the mind can feel a little foggy. The child may have a feeling of being slowed down, can have difficulty concentrating in classroom, doing classroom activities, doing homework, studying, and those on. And then child will have difficulty in remembering new information. Physical symptoms, they include headache, double vision, or a fuzzy vision, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. So dizziness, folks, is one of the more disabling symptoms following concussions. And we'll talk a little more about this towards the end of discussion. And the child can also have sense, increased sensitivity to light, sound, and can present with balance problem and low energy levels. Emotional domain includes more irritability, so child, you can see that child might be a little more irritable and small things can irritate the child, which normally don't. The child may also have experience of sadness, can be more emotional and can demonstrate signs of nervousness or anxiety. And lastly, sleep. Sleep cycle can fall all over the place following a concussion, so it could go at either end of the spectrum. So it could either result in a lot more sleeping than usual, or the child will complain that I am not able to sleep as well as I could, or I have trouble getting to sleep. I cannot fall asleep properly. So long-term effects, usually these symptoms, they resolve maximum in up to four weeks. And now the timeline is kind of variable between two to four weeks. But if the symptoms last more than four weeks, then we label this entity as a post-concussion syndrome. So post-concussion syndrome is seen in a considerable percentage of children and adolescents. And how do we diagnose post-concussion syndrome? It can be diagnosed if three or more of the following factors are present. So these factors include dizziness, headache, fatigue, irritability, Difficulty with concentration, memory impairments, insomnia, and reduced tolerance to stress or emotional excitement or to alcohol. So now what are the long-term effects? So say in previous days when concussions were virtually unknown to people. So people, they continued developing symptoms that led to something called as chronic traumatic encephalopathy or the CTE. So CTE is nothing but it is a progressive neurodegenerative disorder and it is characterized by a very unique pattern of hyperphosphorylated tau, tau protein deposition in the brain. So as you can see in this picture, this 
one here shows the normal brain. And if you look at the picture on the right, you can see that there is an overall shrinkage of the total size of the brain. And you can see there, there is enlargement of the ventricles right here. And there is an excessive deposition of protein all around the brain. So the CTE, it leads to an increase in irritability, change in personality. The child can demonstrate impulsive behavior, poor safety awareness, executive and memory dysfunction. So the child will not make appropriate social decisions. And you can also see reduction of social inhibitions to a certain extent. Some other features, they include depression, attention difficulties, and many a times difficulty in walking. So the unfortunate thing folks about CTE is that, that there is no way to diagnose this when the person is alive. So the diagnosis can be made only post-mortem. So what is happening these days is that people, they are signing up, the athletes, especially professional athletes, they're signing up to donate their brains for research after they pass away. So we can learn more about the chronic traumatic encephalopathy and try and prevent it. Another important feature or the precursor, if you will, the precursor of chronic traumatic encephalopathy is second impact syndrome. So this is something that is very commonly seen in children and adolescents. So what second impact syndrome is that the child sustains a second head injury before completely recovering from the first. So this is something you must have seen, especially people who work in sports that say, for example, if an athlete sustains a fall, hits his or her head and complains of symptoms, the player is immediately removed from the field, given some rest and a brief medical attention, and then player is returned to the field in many instances. So it is very important that players should be completely removed from the game and should be observed for complete recovery. Because if the player is sent back early, the chances are extremely high that this individual will sustain another concussion. So what happens is that we are not allowing enough time for the brain to heal and the brain is sustaining another concussion. So what might happen is this can lead to repetitive trauma, which can further lead to cerebral congestion, leading to cerebral edema and potential brainstem herniation and death. So it is more frequently seen in adolescents as compared to any other adult professional athlete. So it is very important that if as a healthcare professional, you observe any signs or symptoms of concussion, please remove the child from the field and give him or her immediate medical attention because children may or may not report that they are symptomatic because they are very excited and they want to get back in the game. So it is our responsibility as a healthcare professional to look into these things and make appropriate clinical decisions. So that kind of brings us to the history piece and examination tools that we can use. So the core team of pediatric concussion management includes a neuropsychologist, a physician who's trained in concussion, physical therapist who specialize in cervical spine, vestibular treatments and exertional training, athletic trainers, sports team coach and nurses in school settings. So the score team performs the basic assessments of the athlete and if need be, referral is made to further super specialists that include neuroautology for any ear related or vestibular related issues that could not be resolved by PT. Referrals can also be made to neuroophthalmology, optometry for any visual disturbances, psychological counseling, cognitive behavioral therapy, and or speech and language pathologist if any speech impairments are 
observed by any healthcare provider. Medical workup, diagnostics. So it is now known that any kind of X-rays, CT or MRI, they are insensitive to concussion and they are mostly pointless to do ex with the exception of ruling out any fractures or any fresh hematoma or any gross significant edema. So if we suspect any of this, CT will be able to detect these milder fractures, hemorrhage and so on. Whereas MRIs can detect more of white matter changes. If the athlete has also sustained small contusions or hemorrhages, they may be detected on an MRI, maybe a couple of days later. There are more advanced diagnostic testings, including spectroscopy and other things, which are not as frequently used. And we still need to establish more evidence on that. So hence, it is important to understand that the diagnosis is usually made clinically. So on-field neurocognitive assessment, called as IMPACT, that stands for Immediate Post-Concussion Assessment and Cognitive Testing. This has been proved to have considerable reliability and validity and is used frequently in doing cognitive assessments immediately post-concussion. And in this link, you can find the IMPACT test. So as I said, we do have some advanced neuroimaging options like functional MRI, SPECT, PET, and all those things, but they're not often used. And they also do not show that if the concussion has completely healed or not. So what to do? Examination following concussion. So immediately following concussion, a sideline assessment that is on field or acute assessment can include the sideline assessment of concussion tool or the SAC tool. Please look it up. It is a very commonly used and valid tool. SCAT, that stands for Sports Concussion Assessment Tool and Pediatric Specific Tool is now available. So it is also known as SCAT-5. We will talk about that in a moment. So other than that, it is important to have a detailed patient history and to interview for symptoms. Along with that, vestibular ocular testing, balance testing, and neurocognitive testing, they are of prime importance. So now, while you are examining an individual or a child with concussion, there are some red flags warning. So if you come across any of these red flag warnings, the child should be sent immediately to an emergency room and a thorough checkup should be conducted by a physician or a neurologist. So if you see on field that pupillary response is different in one people than the other, and you see that there is one people that is larger than the other, if you see that athlete is reporting of neck pain or tenderness, any headaches, that is getting progressively worse with time, or if the athlete starts to feel drowsy and starts showing signs such as slurring of speech, weakness in one or more extremities, feeling of tingling, numbness, or you feel that the athlete is showing decreased coordination. Additionally, if you find that there is an increased nausea or vomiting, that indicates a sign of increased intracranial pressure, and that may lead further to seizures. Other than that, any increase in confusion or agitation, loss of consciousness, or double vision. If you see any of these, please stop further assessments and send this individual for a detailed medical checkup. So now, if you don't see any red flags, that's a good thing. So then what we do is we proceed to SCAT-5, that is child-specific sport concussion assessment tool. So now the fifth version is out. It is freely available. And I think it is published in one of the, uh, the British Medical Journal articles. So I think it is free for you to use and download. So please look it up. It is a very, very useful tool. So what does it contain? It's a very exhaustive tool. It is very comprehensive and it contains all the red flags, 
any observable signs that you need to look for. It looks at the Glasgow Coma Scale, cervical spine assessment, and it has a whole list of symptom evaluation. And the good thing about this is that it has both child reported and parent reported. Because the thing with pediatric is that the children may not be able to completely or accurately report their symptoms. That's why there is an option of parent reported symptom evaluation as well. And along with that, SCAD5 also has options for cognitive screening and neurological screening that includes a brief balance test. So I would highly recommend using SCAD5 if you're working with pediatric concussion. So now, after the initial episode of concussion is done and the child is getting ready for return to learning or return to sport, it is important that we carefully grade the child's tolerance to exercise and then slowly progress through the treatment protocols. So Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test or BCTT, it is one of the gold standards that has been used to assess degree of exercise tolerance in children post concussion. And it, there is a recent study, I think it was published last year, that also talks about how the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test can be a useful indicator of future outcomes. So please uh, look that study up if you're interested. So what happens here is, in this test, we identify the heart rate at which symptom-specific exacerbation they occur. For example, uh, heart rate threshold. So we look for that heart rate where the symptoms they start to get more exacerbated. So this is done to establish safe levels of exercise for treating concussions and to identify or to differentially diagnose concussion symptoms. That is where the symptoms they are coming from. Because when we look at concussion symptoms, they can come from a couple of different places. For example, let's take a look at dizziness here. So when we take a look at dizziness, it can come from three places primarily. First thing, it can be a direct effect of concussion on the brain tissue. Second thing, it could come from the vestibular system if the vestibular system is involved and or dizziness can also have a cervical spine component. So, so when we treat dizziness, for example, it is very important to rule out where the dizziness is coming from. So anyways, so coming back to the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, it is used to identify physiological variables that are associated with symptom exacerbation, and it is used to monitor and document patients' level of recovery. So a brief overview of what is done in this test is that the visual analog scale is used to obtain a baseline assessment of concussion symptoms. A board's RPE scale or rating of perceived exertion is used and heart rate is monitored at rest. So once we have this baseline data, we start the treadmill speed at 3.2 to 3.6 miles per hour, depending upon the height of athlete. If the athlete is taller than five feet, 10 inches, we usually start with 3.6 miles per hour and zero incline. But if the athlete is shorter than that, we usually start at 3.2 miles per hour. And the athlete starts walking on the treadmill at the speed. After one minute, the incline is increased by one degree and all these symptoms, that is your visual analog scale, works RPE and heart rate, they are re-recorded again. And this process continues over time. And at 15 degrees of incline, when it is reached, the speed is now increased by 0 0.4 miles per hour till the athlete can go. And then the, phase, the test has two minutes of a cool down period. So some criteria for test termination is that if you see a three or more point increase in visual analog scale from rest, for example, the athlete is reporting that the dizziness level is say two on 10 on a visual analog scale at rest, but with the treadmill testing, now the level has come to six on 10. 
So this indicates that there is an increase of more than three points. And this is a criteria for stopping the test. If the patient requests that please stop the test, I cannot go on anymore, please stop the test. If you see signs and symptoms or patient reports of having exhaustion, stop the test. And if you see that the complaints or symptoms, they're rapidly progressing. If the patient feels like fainting, please stop the test. And lastly, if the patient has reached about 90% or more of age predicted heart rate max, please stop the test. So this was in a nutshell about the Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Trust. And now let's talk a little bit about evidence of treatment in physical therapy. So this is still very, very new folks. And the state of evidence, it is extremely limited at this point. So there is a lot of research going on at the moment. So I will present what we currently have. So there are some general guidelines or general principles of intervention. So it is important that symptoms th should be monitored throughout the course of treatment. In the initial stages, ex exertional exercise or activity may be contraindicated. So we start slow with limited repetitions and in more of a quieter environment. Say for example, if the clinic is too bright, too loud, you have many people moving around in the clinic. So it is important that we have a more quieter, a little darker setup for this child with concussion. So here is another debatable topic in the initial stages, whether to rest or not to rest. So initially what was said that, oh, you need to uh, keep resting and do not do any activity till your symptoms go away completely. So that is not true anymore. Then the paradigm shifted to the fact that, okay, let us rest for five to seven days following a concussion before returning to any sort of activity. So Schneider and colleagues, she's a researcher from Canada, Kathleen Schneider, she's done a lot of work in sport-related concussions and she did a randomized control trial to determine how much to rest following a concussion. And in a nutshell, what was found that there was no significant difference, or in other words, if the child rested for more than five days, the child experienced higher symptom severity as compared to the group who rested only for say one to two days and then gradually returned to activity. So the bottom line is that after one to two days of rest, gradual, Careful, calibrated activities should be commenced. So no rest more than 48 hours of injury. And Schneider also reported that multimodal treatment of both cervical spine and vestibular system, they resulted in a bigger improvement for neck pain, dizziness, and headaches as compared to conventional treatment. So a few considerations about physical and cognitive rests. As a clinician, we must advocate and practice. First off, following concussion, the child should be removed from sports and any other physical activities. The cognitive and physical activities should be limited till the time the child is not symptomatic at rest anymore, but they should not completely be stopped. And activities should gradually begin when there are no symptoms at rest. And first and foremost, it is important to understand that the child should be able to tolerate full day participation in school activities before even thinking about returning to play. So return to learn always precedes return to sports or return to play. And only after an athlete has been symptom free for seven to 10 days and has fully returned to school, he or she should begin a stepwise, medically supervised return to play protocol. So when we talk about physical therapy interventions, we can classify it into two broad categories that we see in the clinics. One is cervical spine related symptoms that, uh, that are neck pain, stiffness, range of motion restrictions, cervicogenic dizziness, and deep 
neck flexor muscle weakness. And also the, there is another point which is not mentioned here that is the joint position error or proprioception error seen in cervical spine. And that can be evaluated using a joint position error test. The other domain is the vestibular system that deals with BPPV, vestibular ocular retraining and balance training. So for cervical spine, it is recommended that joint mobilizations and thoracic spine mobilization should be done. Neuromotor training of cervical flexor muscles and ex extensor muscles should be done along with the sensory motor retraining exercises. The next piece is the vestibular system and it depends on case to case basis, but here are the options. We can work on habituation exercises, gaze stabilization, adaptation exercises, partial control training, and it should be more of sport-specific partial control training. And if you see signs and symptoms of BPPV, canalith repositioning maneuver, or Epley's maneuver as you know it, it is recommended. So the graduated return to play protocol, it is, usually consisting of six stages. Stage one, we focus on recovery and practically there is no activity. In the second stage, light aerobic exercises, preferably a bike rather than a treadmill is preferred because bike is a lot more safer and there are minimal chances that the athlete might sustain a fall if there is an increase in symptoms. So aerobic training using a stationary bike, it is recommended and the aim of the stage is to have a slow increase in the heart rate. So once the athlete is past this stage, then we begin sports specific exercise training and add a little bit more movement, make it a little bit more complex. And once the athlete is not symptomatic in the sports specific exercises, then we begin non-contact sports specific drills. This is to first improve the strength and endurance of the athlete, to improve coordination and the cognitive load. Because there is a lot of cognitive demand when the athlete is out in the field. So non-contact training drills, they work on increasing or improving the cognitive processing and the ability to handle cognitive load. So following this, the athlete returns to full contact practice and this is greatly helpful in restoring athletes' confidence. Coach and coaching staff re uh, reassesses the functional skills and helps us to make the determination if the athlete is ready for return to play. And the last stage is that the athlete returns to play. So this is not the decision of one discipline alone, folks. So many disciplines, they work together here. Primarily the athletic trainer, physical therapist, and a physician who is trained in exercise sciences. So they collectively make this determination whether the athlete is ready to return to play or not. So some things to educate our parents and other healthcare providers and teachers at school. So if you know that a child has had concussion and if you are working with the child in, at home or in academic setting, so it is, and as a physical therapist, we should advocate and have a conversation with the teachers or the principal that the individual should have shortened school days and individuals should be able to get breaks during class so the cognitive load is not overwhelming the person. If the child has to take a test or has to submit an assignment, the deadlines should be flexible or the child should have extended deadlines. And if the child is supposed to take an exam or maybe eat lunch. So it is very advisable that a quiet room with dim lighting should be provided for the child to take exam in and or eat lunch. If the child is sitting in class, the child should be allowed to wear earplugs, a hat or sunglasses in the classroom because with concussion, there is a significant increase in sensitivity to light and sound. And finally, the child should be excused from physical education class, any music class, or any exposure to loud, loud noises. And the screen time and reading should be minimized. So finally, the outcomes. 
So it is known that younger people, they have better outcomes than the older age groups because the children, they have better neuroplasticity as compared to adults and they are very resilient. So chances are that outcomes are better in younger athletes as compared to older athletes. When it comes to gender, females, they endorse more symptoms and they take longer time to recover. And now studies are showing that female soccer leads to the highest incidence of concussion in females, and they are less likely to return to sport. The frequency of concussion, it is known that athletes with more than equal to three concussions may be at a greater risk for future concussions, and the outcomes are way poorer as compared to a person who does not have a history of concussion. The presence of comorbidities, if you know while taking history that the child has a condition such as learning disability or any psychiatric condition or attention defi deficit hyperactivity or known as ADHD, the outcomes are far worse as compared to when the child does not have these conditions. So finally, to summarize, it is important that we are aware of the various red flags while we are on the field. We still are in need for age-specific standardized measures to monitor physical therapy, treatment effectiveness, and progress of the client. But we do have SCAT-5, so please use SCAT-5 in the field and try and differentially diagnose where the child's symptoms they are coming from. And once the child is cleared from the physician for physical therapy, please address the cervical spine and vestibular system along with graduated return to play protocol and please trust your child's reporting or parents reporting and symptoms so future research uh, i was fortunate enough to dive a little bit into this and look at more details spe uh, specifically in terms of cervical spine impairment in children and adolescents post concussion and we ended up publishing the study in 2019 so in a nutshell, what we found that upper cervical spine overall, it demonstrated more impairments like C0, C1, C1, C2 levels. They demonstrated more dysfunction as compared to any of the lower cervical vertebrae. So when we are looking at the cervical spine of such child, I think it is reasonable to direct our focus on the upper cervical spine to alleviate symptoms if they're coming from there. And it is very advisable to treat the cervical spine first before moving on to treating the vestibular system. Because if we remember maneuvers like Epley's maneuver or any other vestibular training intervention, it requires a complete or near complete pain-free range of motion. So if you are seeing a child with concussion, I would highly recommend seeing and treating the cervical spine first as compared to vestibular system. And also we are in dire need for age appropriate outcome measures for this population. So we ended up publishing the measurement properties of the dizziness handicap inventory children and adolescent version in 2020. And we are in the process of further revising the scales and developing new outcome measures. So please feel free to refer to these articles and I'll be happy to uh, connect at a later time if you have questions. And also we are all, all the time looking for any collaborations for research. So I welcome your thoughts. I welcome your research ideas. And there is a potential that we can end up collaborating in future. So please feel free to reach out. All right, so these things that are we just talked about. And lastly, uh, another point before I forget, preseason screening, that is very important. So this is something that has been worked on a lot these days. So people are now screening children for cervical spine muscle strength, shoulder muscle strength, their core strength, and so on, to make a determination if it is safe for this child to participate in sport. So if the child demonstrates any significant weakness in any of these muscles, it is recommended that the child must receive strength training and endurance training before they're ready to participate in any sport. And another line of research that I have in my mind is 
looking for concussion in special population like cerebral palsy or Down syndrome or autism, because these folks, they already demonstrate a certain degree of balance impairments and they are a lot more prone to falling and sustaining injury as compared to any other child. All right, so this is my contact information, folks. So please feel free to email me with any questions or if you have more ideas, some potential collaborations. And I will give you an assignment at the end. So if you have not already watched this movie, Concussion, uh, I think Will Smith has done a very good job. And this movie uh, kind of describes in depth how the CTE and what it looks like and what should have been done. And this is how uh, CTE uh, was diagnosed first. So this is something that is based on true events. So I think this will be a fun assignment for you folks to do maybe this week or at any point of time. So, and I once again, thank all of you for being here today. And I appreciate your time on a Friday evening. And I will take any questions if you have. Thank you, sir. It was a very informative session and we will surely watch the movie soon, as soon as possible. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Ma'am, would you like to add up anything about the same? Uh, sir, I would like to ask one more thing. Uh, like it in Buffalo Concussion Treadmill Test, mm -hmm. do they have any specific inclusion criteria because already the patient is suffering to so many sign and symptoms and again we are making them to walk on a treadmill so it's a little bit of risk factor. <laughs> Absolutely. That is a very good question. Thank you for asking that. So my thought on that question is that before even thinking about returning to play, the child should be able to return to a full day of school. And I would yeah. off on the treadmill testing till the child is able to tolerate a stationary bike training and is able to participate completely at school. And once they are there at that point, then I will start treadmill training. And I will be very strictly following the criteria that if there is an increase beyond three points, at any time on the visual analog scale, I would immediately terminate the test. And of course, this test is medically supervised. So we yeah. will have to sit on board to make sure that we can handle any kind of emergency. So definitely, I will wait till then before I put the child on the treadmill. That's true. Any, uh, 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 any incidents can be seen in cricket injuries? Actually, I have not come across any study that talks about concussions in cricket per se. So mm. I think that's a very good area to explore because in India, yeah. everybody, pretty much everybody plays cricket. Yeah. So, and many of us, we cannot afford all the protective right. gear. And having sustained concussion myself from cricket, so I can relate. So definitely, it'll be something very much worth looking into. Yes, it was a very nice session. Thank you, sir. Thank, Thank you for sharing your information with us. Thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate that. Yes. Thank you, sir and ma'am. It was indeed a very great and informative session. It was very enlightening for us to have you here. Thank you, sir. It has been a privilege to learn about this from someone like you. Also, I would like to thank Physio TV team for hosting this session and Sancheti Institute College of Physiotherapy for giving us this platform. Also, before signing off, I would like to thank our viewers for your time and support. Have a great evening. Thank you, everybody. Have a nice evening. Thank you. Thank you, Physio team. Thank you.